Cool. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Alex. Uh, I lead the source control team at Canva. Um, I'd like to share with you today a bit about the journey we've been on with monorepos um, and also a bunch of tools that we've used along the way. Cool. Uh, yeah, so we're going to look a bit at the kind of problems we saw, um, about looking, analyzing the actual repo, um, and then talking a bit about the server side, the CI system, and the local environment, which I think you've heard a lot about now. <laughs> cool. So at Canva, every week, you know, hundreds of engineers have thousands of pull requests. Tens of thousands of files are changing these days. You can see there it's almost 80,000 files change a week. Um, during peak working hours, trunk moves every two minutes. And this started, people started to notice that things were taking a lot longer. In fact, they were doubling year on year in terms of using Git. And this wasn't great in terms of pushing, but some people were really waiting quite a while for their pushes. So uh, the first step we looked at is, is there something wrong with our repository? Uh, I mean, as you've heard, about half a million files is pretty standard. What's going on here? The first problem we found was uh, we initially considered um, stale commits and branches to be six months old. But things were actually moving so quickly that two months was a better place to put it. Uh, and by the time we realized this, about half the branches we had would have been automatically deleted as stale. Um, we then used uh, the git sizer tool. And you know most things were OK. But the thing that gave it the most concern was the number of directories. Uh, we have a lot of microservices. Um, <laughs> And it turned out that uh, Canva relies a lot on microservices. Um, and as more and more became developed and they became even more complicated, the folder structures were getting deeper and deeper. Uh, so for example, this is a 16-level folder structure um, that might be familiar to Java developers. Uh, we also looked at the content. Uh, you know, uh, there's a bunch of file types there, but there's this weird one at the top, XLF. Um, so Canva is translated into over 100 languages. Uh, and every component has a corresponding translation file for, per language. So you can see this just skyrockets. Um, the other uh, interesting file was feature flags. Uh, we had a feature flag system where you had to declare the flags in the source code. Uh, so as there were more features, there were more feature flags. Um, for these features, uh, these ways that we're using Git as a database, we're now considering like other approaches. But it, you know, having a large code base already, it's a bit hard to make changes like that. Um, the other thing we looked at was the CI system. Um, we store our CI pipelines in Git. So uh, every time a task has to happen on CI, even if it doesn't really need the whole content of the monorepo, uh, it does need a fetch and a checkout. Uh, and more concerningly, this maximum checkout time started to go up and up and up. Uh, you know, the absolute difference between 16 seconds and 21 seconds for a human probably isn't that different. But when you're talking about millions of times, it really starts to add up. <laughs> uh, and in fact, uh, the numbers are a bit small here, but it, it's about 80,000 requests we were seeing uh, every 20 minutes. Whoop. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, the initial idea we had was, oh, OK, we can store a copy of the repository on S3, uh, pull it down. The problem, again, is that throughout the day, that snapshot was already well out of date. So we had a bit of a think. And we Googled around, and we found this project uh, from an open source project from Google uh, called Goblet. Uh, Goblet is a Git proxy server. There was this little warning note at the bottom. It's always good to have a warning note. Uh, you will need to write some glue code. So we wrote some glue code. 
Uh, we linked it up with uh, the way the GitHub authentication works. We added some extra monitoring so that we could kind of see what was going on. We deployed this out to a very small percentage. And all the cache servers instantly stopped responding. 100% uh, memory usage, 100% CPU usage. We had failed to realize what Goblet was warning us, which is that it was designed for Google open source code, where there's one commit that lots of people download, while we have lots of people wanting to lo download lots of different commits, all at exactly the same time. So we had a look around. In that previous uh, screenshot, it said pack object. So we Googled pack object. And we found this note in the uh, git source code commit that said, you might want to install the insert a caching layer around pack objects. It's an ideal place to consolidate identical requests. So that's what we did. Uh, we, uh, there was lots of really great um, enhancements for monorepos uh, coming out, you know, multi-index uh, packs, all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, we couldn't use that with go-git because it was completely separate to the libgit. Um, we added a queued pool, so if one request came in for one commit, we'd wait until we had that ready. Uh, but most importantly, we added a pack object cache hook. Um, and this was, uh, we found it really helpful to look at the way that GitLab Gitly, um, they had some really great notes about implementing this that helped us des design it. Um, if you're interested, um, I've put up our fork uh, on the Canva public repository. It probably isn't, is, isn't upstreamable because it's a completely different use case, but uh, have a look. <laughs> so when we did that, we actually managed to process more fetches uh, by a whole third. So not only was it you know, more reliable, but it was actually more efficient. There were some other interesting things we found with that analytics we put in. Um, you know, the worst case was now less than 20 seconds, which sounds all right. But the really interesting one was when we looked at the server side of that analytics, we were actually making the Git server we were pulling from a lot happier because we were pacing, our uh, pulled worker queue was actually kind of providing a rate limit, uh, <laughs> which makes everybody happy because that's the same uh, Git server that uh, our engineers use. Cool. Uh, this will sound very familiar to you. Uh, we had implemented a Bazel sparse checkout uh, engine. Uh, this was pretty good. We also switched from nothing to Watchman to native FS monitor, uh, which our sparse checkout is 7 to 32% of files. Um, so maybe not the best. We need to optimize the build graph, but you know, decent stuff, but to really get to the next frontier, we needed a bit more data. So in looking at previous talks at Git Merge, there was this mention, you should really measure first, and we did that. We looked at the trace2 uh, stuff, and we hooked it into our existing uh, traceability solution, which was based on open telemetry. So we built this glue tool called Oli, which translates trace2 into um, open telemetry traces. Uh, so here's, you know, for example, fetches uh, in Jaeger, which is the interface. Um, you can drill into a operation and see all the sub operations. Uh, probably the most interesting for us was we were augmenting the data with extra tags. So for example, we found once we implemented this on engineer's laptop, we found 13 different versions of Git in our environment, including some that we didn't know about inside, say, a a Atom or Xcode or GitHub Desktop. Um, the other thing was we were able to actually quantify turning off some of those features uh, or turning on, like, many files or, um, you know, untracked cache. Uh, so this was really good because, uh, you know, we actually knew what we were doing was actually beneficial. Again, we, something we didn't realize was 
we could actually take that data from Jaeger and put it into Kibana, which meant that we actually now had visibility over all the errors and all the timings, which helps find these issues. And this worked so well that we decided we'd implement it on CI too. Uh, so you can see, you know, there's 155,000 traces is, is no problem. So that was really good. <laughs> um, as an example of something we found later, uh, we disabled enumerate untracked on CI because CI didn't really need to know that information in status. It just wanted to know, you know, like what branch am I in? Um, we also discovered some bottlenecks about Git LFS. There were some features we weren't using, like uh, being able to lock files. Um, there's also a pure SSH protocol that didn't seem to be doing a lot. It was just timeouting for four seconds. Uh, so we turned those off, uh, and that actually saved us 15 seconds on checkout and commit, which made engineers very happy. Cool. Uh, so that's my talk. Uh, if you want to hit read more, um, there's a post on the engineering blog, or I'm at Maxius on GitHub and Twitter. Cool. Thanks.